A pleasant good evening to everyone. And we are indeed delighted to have you once again with us. The ladies from the Silver Sands Church of God, again, we welcome you to our session on how does your garden grow? Uh, edible gardens. And I'm sure that you're looking forward to today's um, session with Stacy and Alvin again. We've learned quite a lot from them in the previous sessions, and we do look forward to today's session uh, with great anticipation, in particularly uh, what the topic is, ash is supply harvest. But before we go into our session, I would invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask God's blessing and invite his presence among us. Heavenly Father, today we thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. We are grateful for your tender mercies, which are extended to us day by day. You are the creator of all things and you are the preserver of life. We thank you for your provision and for your protection. Today, we remember our brothers and sisters in St. Vincent. We thank you, dear Lord, for protecting them as well. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would cover their families who are the ones who are displaced. We pray, dear God, that you would really provide for them sh shelter, food, meet their every need. And we know, dear God, that you are faithful. You've promised, dear God, to supply all our needs according to your riches and glory. And we know, dear God, that your riches in glory, they do not run short. And today we ask, Heavenly Father, that you continue to bless them. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would cover us under your blood. We invite your presence among us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would touch Stacy and Alvin. Help, dear God, as they impart this knowledge onto us. Give us open hearts. Heavenly Father, that at the end of this session, it wouldn't just be wasted, but we would be all willing to go out and do as you, as we would have learned. I pray, Father, that you continue to bless us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. So again, welcome to one and all. Maybe in the chat, you can let us know who you are, who is with us, and where you're from. And as I would have said before, today we are looking at ash, a supply harvest. And those of you who are in Barbados and those who might be following from abroad, you might know why this is a hot topic today because of the eruption of the La Sofrere volcano in neighboring St. Vincent. And yes, we in Barbados have felt the effects. We have the ash all around us. And although it might be a temporary discomfort, I am sure that we're looking forward to the long-term gains and Stacy and Alvin will tell you all about that. So before, without any further ado, we welcome Stacy and Alvin to present to us this evening. Welcome. Thank you, Judy. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking the time out to join us. A special welcome to my co-presenter, Alvin. Over the past week, our beautiful island of Barbados has been affected by severe ash fall. And this is a direct result of the eruption of last Sufair volcano in St. Vincent. This is definitely a new phenomenon for most of us, certainly because our island is made of coral limestone and not of volcanic rock. Added to this, the last time our island experienced ash fall was in 1979 from the same La Sufair volcano. The entire island of Barbados is currently littered with ash fall. And for homeowners, gardeners, and farmers alike, this has certainly been a surplus harvest, not of crops, but of ash. And this week, we have been busy cleaning our homes and our surroundings, but one question remains, what do we do with the ash? Our presentation this evening is therefore aptly named Ash, a surplus harvest, and Alvin and I will be sharing with you much of what we have learned about the ash, primarily as it relates to crops and also on safe cleanup, storage, and the disposal of the ash. So it is therefore my pr privilege to turn over the reins to Alvin to start our presentation this afternoon. Hi, good evening. Hi, Stacey. Hi, Judy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's certainly a pleasure to be here, to be here this evening as we deal with this hot topic as ash. It's a current topic. It's something on not only the minds, but certainly it's all around us. It's in our gardens, 
it's in our homes, it's on the door, it's in the road. Uh, this evening, we're going to look to see what is ASH exactly, uh, what are the benefits of ASH, if there are any benefits, and uh, what do, should you do with your ASH? Okay, so let's start from the beginning. What is ASH? Now, ASH is a mixture of rock, minerals, and also glass particles that's expelled from the volcano. And in this case, it is the volcano in St. Vincent during a volcano eruption. Along with this ash, there's also water vapor and other hot gases that what we see pure out of the volcano. And the volcano ash is part of a dark, it's part of the dark columns that will rise up from the volcano. And this, what we call eruption, goes up into the atmosphere, sometimes many miles into the atmosphere, and it will cause it to travel. The next slide, please. Now, also, not only will there be all the ash, but it's something called a volcanic glass. And this is formed when the magments, which are rapidly cooling and solidified during an eruption. Now, this glass is typically the remains of tiny gas bubbles that come out from the ash that develop during and develop, sorry, and grew in a size. And finally, that comes to the surface. So there's a volcanic ash and then there's a volcanic glass. Now, let's look at the neutrino components of ash or what ash is made up of. Now, ash contains, uh, we use word high amounts, even though we haven't been able to measure it yet, but high amounts of calcium, magnesium, potassium, phosphate, fluorine, and sulfur. And probably the most important is the last two, the fluorine and the sulfur. Now, why we see we haven't been able to measure it because each volcano in the different parts of the world will have different values of the calcium, different values of the magnesium. So what we are planning to do, I know for sure, even in Barbados, is to actually measure, get some ash and look and see what actually is the value. Because when the values are very high is when the ash becomes very dangerous. So all of these are part of the ash. Now, the texture of the ash is a coarse particle and the ash looks and feel like sandy or grains, grains of sand. Okay, I had one little child ask me only this week, well, it don't look like ash because you know, we think about ash as a black thing that when you burn wood, but because of the heat of the volcano, it comes out in a powder, right? So it's, it's a powder or sandy form. And the particles are so small, it's dispersed by the wind. So the wind, as you will know in Barbados, have move it from St. Vincent over 100 kilometers over to Barbados. And these particles are, just go back, no, no problem. So these particles move from one part of the island off to another island, right? And when that ash comes down to the ground, the ash column is moved by the wind and it's called the ash plumes, okay? I know some of you may not be too fancy with all the words, but the correct word is really the ash plume. And that ash plume or that ash falls to the ground and when it falls to the ground then it becomes then a problem in vertical commerce for some of us eventually when ash falls to the ground it creates a layer a thick layer of dust like material on the surface of the ground or on the surface of your plant so the ash is in the air and for some reason because of the distance it's traveled across and then it falls in barbados or it falls in certain parts of Barbados. Um, from last week, Saturday, we really felt the effects of it. And what I would say is, thank God, we didn't have the whole island that had the same impact. On uh, one day, it was more to the north, and another day, it was more to the south. So certain parts of the island had different impacts of this ash. Now, the question is, is volcanic ash harmful or beneficial to your plants? All right? Is volcanic ash harmful or beneficial to your plants? So let me answer that question by saying, the ash ejected from the volcano can disrupt agriculture or crops if it is come in direct contact to your plant or to the surface of the leaf. So if the ash falls on your leaf, it becomes harmful to your plant. If the ash falls on the ground, and there are certain benefits for that, and you're gonna learn about those benefits later on, it is okay. But certainly once it has an impact on the leaf, and it falls and remain on the leaf, it becomes harmful to your plant. Next slide. 
Now let's look at some of the factors which affect or impact the volcanic ash on arable crops, okay? Now it depends on the crop you, you have. It depends on the stage of the crop. So if you have young seedlings just about, you just transplant them, those will have impact also. The duration of the eruption, um, what I would say is, thank God we didn't have an eruption lasting over 24 hours. We had a couple of hours during the day, or a couple of hours during the night, and we had a break. So that will reduce the impact. The time of the year, um, we are actually in the dry season, which is good and bad. So the time of the year also is very important. The climate, what's happening in the climate, and most of all, the timing and intensity of subsequent rainfall. Um, if you have rain right after the ash is blowing, you know, we people call it acid rain or rain ash, what you may call it, and that also may have an impact on your crops. So the stage of the development of your crop, at what stage, we're gonna look at this later on, the duration of the eruption, or do, for us, it would be the duration of the ash, how long, how many days, and how much ash will be falling on our crops and also the climate. So let's look at it a little more. Now, we may give you some examples of the effects of ash based on certain crops. Now, if you have peas, right? And from the time you emerge or what you call germination until the end of flowering, those peas will have a serious effect if ash falls on them. Peas from the emergence or we say germination until the end of flowering. Squash or what we call the cucurbits, during the initial stage of growth and up to flowering, it will have an ash will have impact on the, your cucurbits or your cucumbers and your squash. I repeat again, during the initial stage of growth and up to flowering. Tomatoes, during seed immersion or germination and up to flowering stage, ash will have a serious impact on your tomatoes. And sweet corn, during the early stage of growth, you will also have a serious problem if ash comes on your sweet corn. So basically speaking, it is that early part of the stage of the plant, whichever crop you're growing, and mainly up to the flowering stage, that when you have that ash, and remember the, the volumes or the degree of sulfur, it may be high, the degree of um, the potassium, the P and the K, it also may be how you're not sure, but once the ash falls on the leaf during this stage, it will have some impact or impact on your crops. Next slide. The harmful effects of volcanic ash. Now, we talk about this, the exposure to the fluorine may adversely affect your plants, humans, as you know us, and also animals. So briefly, just let me say that fluorine and sulfur in large amounts, I mean, terms of the percentage, touching the plant leaf surface will have a uh, impact or maybe toxic to the plant, okay? Especially the fluorine and sulfur in large amounts will be toxic to the plant. When the ash falls on the ground and you allow it to remain at the surface of the ground around your plants and you don't incorporate, incorporate the ash in the soil, what happens, the ash then acts like a cement, especially if it's watered, it gets very hard. And that will also have an impact on the root system of your plant. Because if you have cement around and there's, there's no air penetrating, there's no water to get down to the plant, then you will have an impact from the ash. Now, for those people who have some livestock, maybe sheep or cows, if your animal is grazing grass that have ash on it, Remember the ash acts like a cement, especially the fluorine. And when your animal eats the grass and goes into the stomach, it actually causes a blockage uh, or something what we call bloat in livestock. And especially sheep that graze right down to the bottom, the grass, it will have a severe impact on sheep. So sometimes I might advise if you have sheep around, especially our livestock, you should bring them indoors. You should give them some hair and don't allow them to eat the grass or any vegetative matter that actually have ash on it. Next slide. Okay, so we're gonna look at some examples of how ash affects different crops, okay? Uh, we're gonna look at the peat, for, the peat fruits, sorry. Those are the oranges, the grapefruits and the limes, right? Especially the limes, we know the limes in Barbados. And there are three dangerous periods. Now during the blossoming stage, 
where the, um, the, as, the acidic level of the ash is less than three. Remember, we talk about the pH of ash. It is acidic. When it's less than three, it can cause burn to the plant tissues, which will result in poor pollination. Okay, so when that pH is too low, it actually burns the, the plant and it's poor pollination. At six to eight weeks after blooming or blossoming, when the skin of your fruit is particularly sensitive. So six to eight weeks when your fruit skin is what we call soft and sensitive and you have ash particles going on your fruit, it is also dangerous, remember, at that stage. And then the later stage of development, when the fruit is prone to cosmetic blemishes, when, it, when it's ready to harvest, as you can see, and sometimes if you squeeze it, it's too soft or you may puncture it. At that stage, you have ash resting on your fruits, your limes or your oranges is also very susceptible. So at three stages, at that stage when it's ready to harvest, the first six to eight weeks, when the fruit is now developing and when you actually have that pH less than three, when it actually affects the blossoms, it will damage your pig fruits. The next one we're gonna look at now is the stone fruits, which is the mangoes, which we love, the doubts, the golden apples, and our Bajan Akis, not Jamaican Akis, our Bajan Akis. Now these are susceptible at the same time as your pig fruits, except that at the early fruit development period, we're talking about the first six weeks after blossoming, the first six weeks after blossoming, they are more they are more sensitive and we ash will also cause problems at this stage. The first six weeks. So if you have, I know your mango tree may not be blossoming now. So thank God we talk about the seasons, but certainly I don't know for sure the golden apple and other trees may be at that stage. So uh, for the stone fruits, yes, your stone fruits can be affected by the ash, but it depends on the time or what we call the period of development that your trees are at. And so certainly you have to pay attention to your fruit trees. Okay, next one. Okay, how harmful, so the harmful effects of volcanic ash on plants, right? And basically speaking, you were we talking about what impact will the volcanic ash have on plants. Now the weight of the ash can severely physically impact your plant. Because remember the ash falls on the leaf and it stays on the leaf. And if you have anything over three millimeters, which is about half an inch that remains on the leaf, it may even cause the branch or the stems to snap, right? Because because of the weight, then your leaves may also partially burn. And actually before the burn, which is turning brown, they may even turn yellow. So you may see a yellowing of the leaf and then eventually a browning of the leaves, which means you actually burn and then partially burying the leaf and the breaking of the delicate leaves as well. For the bigger trees or the larger trees, the, the weight of the ash is you break the stems and the branches because for some reason the ash sticks on the leaf. Uh, I don't know how it does that, but it literally sticks on the leaf. And when it sticks on the leaf, it causes additional problems because when the ash covers the leaf, it actually stops the plant from photosynthesizing, which means it, it cannot turn green, right? It cannot respire and it cannot transpire the nutrients and the water. So literally speaking, the ash suffocates your plant if it remains on the leaf. It literally suffocates your plant so it can't breathe, it can't move the water particles and the nutrients up and down and the photosynthesizing, which means you want to turn green, it can't do anything like that. So then your plant will eventually die because of the ash remaining on the surface of the leaf. Now, which crops are more susceptible to the ash? Certainly your leafy crops, your lettuce, your cabbage, your Chinese cabbage, your pak chow, whatever you may call it. Those are the ones that are more susceptible. They, they are the ones that, what I may say, may die or show you the harm effects very easily. So you have to pay attention to your leafy crops first. Your herbs, um, your, your seasonings, your, your thyme, those are more tolerant because they are faster growing and they will be able to tolerate the ash better. And then your tomatoes and your eggplants, that family, even your sweet peppers, right? Those may be even more tolerant, but also you can prune those crops. 
So your tomatoes and you see the ash on the leaf, it's still trying to wipe off all the ash. You could just try to prune them and let them go to a different stage. They will recover your eggplants, even your okras. If you prune them or what you say in Barbie, let's cut them back to allow them to spring back after the ash is gone or has been reduced. You, those, those crops will even be better. But certainly you may have to pay close attention to your leafy crops. Those are the ones that won't spring back and those are the ones actually that will have the most impact on it. Over to Stacy. Thank you, Alvin. So Alvin would have discussed most of the harmful effects of the volcanic ash on plants. And that's a good segue into looking at the beneficial effects of the volcanic ash. For starters, the volcanic ash actually improves soil fertility. And as Alvin would have mentioned earlier, the acidic ash, it lowers the pH of the soil. This is very important in Barbados. Our pH level tends to be slightly alkaline, but vegetables, grasses, and most ornamental plants, for those of you that are into ornamental plants, those tend to like slightly acidic soils, and the ash can actually reduce the pH to slightly acidic, around 5.8 to 6.5, which the vegetables actually prefer. It also in improves the water holding capacity of the soils as well. Um, if you notice many waterfalls, you find that it actually gets the cement and it's actually holding the water. So when this ash is actually incorporated into the soils, it can actually improve the water holding capacity of soils. And it will definitely add to the nutritional benefit of the soil. The slow release of the properties in the volcanic ash, for example, the nutrients, it's actually a slow release. You can compare it to a slow release fertilizer. And because it is slow release, um, it makes it very easy um, to minimize those deficiencies that fast growing plants sometimes experience. So over time, because the release is actually very slow, you're gonna find that over time, the nutrients will actually be released in the soil and picked up by the plants. So you may not see the beneficial effects now, but you will definitely see them in months and years to come. So this will, this slow release actually allows the plants to have a consistent feeding um, of this, of the nutrients and for, and it's actually better than some of the other, for some fertilizers that you may have because it has in multiple nutrients. So therefore in years and months to come, you should actually see that surplus harvest. Now, many persons have been asking, should we eat crops that are covered with ash? And the best answer that we can give you is that you have to use your best judgment. Usually, ash and small are unlikely to penetrate some of your fruits and vegetables. But as Alvin would have mentioned earlier, you see that it actually covers a lot of your leafy crops. So safety has to be paramount here. Safety becomes more of an issue depending on how much ash has collected on your produce. So you need to actually inspect your crops and ensure that it does, they don't have too much ash building up. And this is why it is important that you check your crops daily and see if you can actually get rid of some of the buildup of that ash from your crops. Now, if your garden has a heavy layer of ash, the risk obviously will be greater. So again, you need to err on the side of caution. You use your best judgment when you're examining your crops and you make that decision as to whether you want to take in um, some of these crops that have been ash covered. Now, you can also clean your ash covered crops. Alvin would have mentioned that tomatoes and those sweet peppers and such like tend to be more resistant to the ash. So you can actually clean those crops. Um, you can pick them, you can harvest them, you can clean them. And in addition to rinsing them, you can actually peel them when you're ready to use them. And that would actually help get rid of the outer coat that would have been covered with the ash. As it relates to your leaf crops, like lettuce and Chinese cabbage and those other greens, whether it's kale or even Swiss chard, what you can do is to strip, strip the outer leaves. Um, those are, you can strip the outer leaves and those outer leaves will probably have more of that volcanic ash. So by stripping away those outer leaves, you're actually going to reduce the uh, amount of the, the particular pro produce that will have the volcanic ash on it. And for a more thorough cleaning, and I know that we are all familiar with this, you can soak your vegetables and your fruits in a 10% vinegar solution. So this is one part white vinegar to 
nine parts water and that actually gives you a 10 percent um, vinegar solution or you can add one teaspoon of vinegar to three cups of water and a cup is actually 250 milliliters. So you can add one teaspoon of vinegar to three cups of water and that will provide a good dilute vinegar solution which can help lift the salt particles off of the vegetables. And those vegetables like kale and lettuce and such like, they can actually um, tolerate this cleaning with the, the white vinegar. We're also going to share with you this after this evening some measures that can be taken to prevent further damage to your crops after ash fall. Now, it, it, this is obviously dependent on whether you have a small farm or whether you have a medium to large enterprise. So if you or if you have a medium to medium sized farm, you can actually use the overhead irrigation um, to wash off the leaf surface and you can do this daily so that that ash fall does not build up. Now, if you have, if you're into container gardening, you can take your hose and you can put it on a mist setting. The mist setting is actually very good. You're not going to be dousing those plants, but you're going to be using that mist setting. And that mist setting can actually help wash away some of the ash from the leaves. And if you have seedlings, you can use a mister, a bottle with a mist setting as well to spray off some of that ash from your seedlings. Another measure that we recommend is boosting your plants with a foliar fertilizer. And the one that we actually recommend is 20, 20, 20. This gives, um, this will give you the new, um, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium in equal parts. Um, so you can go to your favorite hardware store and you can ask for that foliar fertilizer, which you can then apply to your plants, which will help to boost your plants and, and, and help them for prevent further damage um, after the ash fall. Another measure that we recommend is to make sure that you ensure that you cover your crops with shade netting. And this is actually to reduce the volume of ash that will be getting to your plants. Now here, the smaller the holes in your shade netting, the better because it will eliminate or it will prevent a lot of ash from getting to your crops. Now, I know some persons have been asking about using sheets and such like, we generally don't recommend um, using the, if the sheets, but if you have no other choice, you will need to ensure that um, that air is still circulating. So again, the smaller the holes in your shade netting, the better. And again, this shade netting is actually available from any hardware store. The popular hardware stores here generally say sell shade netting. So you can actually go and get that shade netting and you can cover your crops with to prevent or to mitigate against further damage to your crops after ash fall. Now, you would recognize that the ash fall has not only affected us as it has only affected our plants, it has also affected our homes. Um, a lot of it is covering our homes and our offices and even our farms. So for you persons that are interested in have, having a bit more information on how to clean up, uh, we're going to be sharing, with, sharing that with you this, this evening. So after the ash fall, um, what you can do is to make sure that you clean up, but cleaning up the volcanic ash can be very costly and it can be extremely time consuming. Um, personally, I actually had to go and buy additional tools to clean up outside because um, this, as I said, it's a new phenomenon to us. And sometimes the tools that you may have home may not be enough to clean up. So it can be costly, but what we advocate is that communities or neighborhoods can actually come together in coordinated efforts to dispose of the ash in order to maintain the safety of the residents in communities and neighborhoods. And this is, this is a, where we can share our Barbadian and showcase our Barbadian spirit and look out for our neighbors. Because if you clean your house, you clean your office, you clean your farm, and your neighbor is not cleaning, then outside is dry, you're going to find that that ash is still going to be blowing back at your particular location. So the cleanup effort has to be coordinated. In terms of cleaning up, Yes, volcanic ash is very difficult to clean up because the dust size particles can enter practically everything. For farmers, for you that have vehicles, they are, it will enter your farm vehicles, it will enter your cars, um, your office buildings. Some of you probably did not even think about the, the 
ash entering like your computers and such like, and you know that farm records are very important to farmers. So it's important that you make sure that you clean all of the, your computer equipment um, to avoid any malfunctioning. You need to ensure that you cover um, you clean your cars, you can use um, a tarp to cover the cars um, to prevent further ash fall or, or ash fall reaching the cars. And you can also, if ash is coming into your office or your farm building where you have your computer equipment, you can also use tarps to cover your computer equipment as well to further protect them. Because if you don't do that, you may find that the ash can actually severely erode anything that it comes into contact with, including your farm machinery. In terms of cleaning up the ash, we recommend that you ensure that you put on a mask. The particles that we have here in Barbados, because they have been transported by the wind, they're very light, they're very fine. And what you will see happening is that they, they, will, they will blow some things even when you're cleaning up. So we are encouraging you um, to ensure that you put on your mask. Uh, we've been wearing masks for a long time now, um, and we have grown accustomed to wearing them. So this is an added benefit. So you put on your mask before you you start to clean up. And if in the event that you don't have one to hand, um, you can actually use a wet cloth because that wet cloth would allow some of those particles to stick on the outside and prevent the ash from getting into your nasal passages and ultimately into your respiratory system. Um, you need to cover as much of your skin as possible. So we recommend wearing um, a long sleeve shirt and long pants. Um, you should wear gloves as well. Um, if you have a hat, you can actually put on um, a hat. And for those of you that want to be a little bit more protected, there are actually some disposable kits that are sold. They're actually um, disposable kits. They cover you from head literally right down to your, your ankles. And these are available again at your hardware stores. Um, they cost generally about $15. So you can purchase one of those if you so desire so that you can actually cover your skin. And it's, they're actually made from the same material that the mask, the disposable masks are made from. So they actually prevent um, those dust particles, those volcanic ash particles, sorry, from getting um, close to your skin. You also need to ensure that you keep your doors and windows closed. And um, this in itself, although you think it is a challenge because you, if, if, you can't use ACs in your offices and even if your farm, your farm office may have um, AC, if you're at home, you can't, you shouldn't be using your AC. So I know it's a challenge um, to keep your door, your doors and windows closed because outside um, have been unbearably hot, but you need to do this to prevent ash from coming in. Um, and you also need, when you're cleaning up, we recommend that you lightly dampen the ash to prevent it from billowing when you sweep up because you, you, you probably would have seen that when you sweep up dry ash, it actually starts to billow. And um, this can actually cause further challenges or prevent further challenges. So you don't want to, you really don't want to be sweeping up the ash with it billowing. So we recommend that you lightly, we're not telling you to dampen it because if you dampen it, 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 it starts to take on the consistency of cement. So you don't want to um, saturate it, but you can actually lightly dampen it to prevent it from billowing. And we encourage you to remove the ash before rain, because again, um, although the rain has been washing off some of the ash from your plants and such like um, the, the, the ash around your homes and sometimes even on the plants, depending on how thick the layer is, you will find that the rain will actually cause um, the, the ash to take on that cement texture, which again, will become very heavy for your plants. And like Alvin said earlier, you will find that it can actually lead down to the breaking off of leaves and such like. And we also recommend that you don't do too much rubbing because the, the ash actually contains a lot of sharp broken edges as well. And so although it's fine, and you will find that it's very abrasive. So you don't want to be doing too much rubbing. In terms of the actual cleanup, we generally recommend that you clean your roof first. And um, there are some persons that I know this week, over the past week would have learned this the hard way because you go out, you clean up your patios, you may clean up around your house, around your farm. And then you recognize that the ash is still coming down from the roof. So as long as it is safe to do so, and I'm not advocating that you do it yourself, you can, if you can, 
um, afford to, you can, you may be, you may want to call in a professional that can um, go to your roof and sweep it down if you are not comfortable in doing that because we do not want any accidents coming out of this. So we generally recommend that you 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 get some person that is comfortable doing um, doing this uh, um, going up to the roof to clean your your house or your farm roof. Now you you also have to clear the ash from your guttering, and it's also very important that you clear the ash from your down plates. Again, the ash states on the consistency of cement, so it would actually block your down plates, and this is very important for those of you out there that may be that may have a roof fed water supply. I know there are some farmers that have um, tanks and they harvest the roof, the water from their roof. And you, you, you have to disconnect those plates because if you don't disconnect them, you will find that the ash will not only get into your tanks, but it can also block um, those down plates as well as, as the guttering. In terms of cleaning indoors, um, you can use the option of using a vacuum cleaner where possible. If a vacuum cleaner is not available, what you can also do is to damp, use a damp cloth. So you can use, let's say a microfiber cloth, you can dampen it and you can use that to remove the ash from, surface, from your surfaces. And again, you want to avoid vigorous rubbing because of the abrasive nature of the volcanic ash. And you can also shovel or sweep up the ash. And we have been it has been recommended to us here in Barbados that we we use heavy duty plastic bags to store our ash. This is very important because you don't want to be using lightweight plastic bags that may break easily because you will be definitely defeating the purpose of putting the ash in plastic bags. Now, if the layer of ash is more than about a quarter inch thick and you can use your best judgment here, you scoop it up in a shovel and then you can use a broom to sweep up whatever ash is left on the surface. And then you can empty that shovel or dustpan into your heavy duty plastic bags. It is also very important that you tie the bags so that it, you avoid the ash blowing out of the top of the garbage bags. This is very important. You want to clean up the ash, you place them in plastic bags, but you have to make sure that you tie the bags at the end so that it does that the ash does not blow out. And then you have to start all over again. There are some possible places that you can also dispose of your ash. We highly recommend um, incorporating the ash, you can put it on your household gardens and your lawns. And this is particularly if the ash fall in your area is light. Um, if you have, you can also store it, but you can also take the ash and you can incorporate it in your garden beds. And I've seen some farmers and some hobbyist farmers already doing this, incorporating that ash into the garden beds. Now, some persons may be asking, what is the ratio? We usually say that um, about one pound, so you can estimate it, one pound of volcanic ash to about a square meter of space, or you can say one part um, ash to about eight parts or seven, seven to eight parts soil. So if you're going to be using it to germinate your seedlings and you're adding this, let's say you're adding it to your, your, your mix, your mix, your soil mix, um, you may want to not add too much, but you can, you can generally go with a one to seven or one to eight um, ratio as it relates to adding it to your, your soil mixes. You can also place or dispose your ash into or use your rate of ways. Um, I, I've seen some of my friends as and, and other farmers placing um, the or use ash because it has the consistency of cement. Some persons have also used it to fill in like holes in their in their driveways and and they've actually ensured that they 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 put it in so that and they wet it and it takes on the consistency so it can actually help in terms of grading um your your areas like your or use rate of ways or even if you have um, areas around your homes that may need filling in, you can safely place the volcanic ash there. But again, you may need to, to dampen it as well so that it takes on the consistency of cement. You can also place it in hollow areas on your private property, but you obviously have to accept the full responsibility for stabilizing this ash so that it doesn't blow and go to your neighbors and such like. And if you have like an old pit, or if you have like, let's say you may be doing some construction around your house, you're also free 
um, to place that volcanic ash there as well. In terms of correct disposal of the volcanic ash, we usually encourage you to cover the volcanic ash at the disposal sites and you can actually use a heavy material such as soil or gravel so again if you're going to be disposing it and you have some soil mitts around your house or some gravel you can also add that to the disposal site and this again will prevent the ash from drying out and, and blowing around you, at your disposal sites you can also feel free to fertilize and then you can um, start to seed or germinate your seeds at the disposal site to start um, your vegetative or vegetation growing and you can use straw or even coconut mulch whatever mulch is available you can actually use to cover the ash and again we are recommending this because outside can become very dry and you don't want that ash um, becoming very dried out and then it is blowing all around so this is this is why you need to ensure that you dampen that ash some persons have also been at about storing that volcanic ash. Definitely you should and you can definitely store your volcanic ash. We recommend storing that volcanic ash in plastic containers but again you want to ensure that the plastic container have airtight lids. This is very important because you don't want that if you're going to be storing these um, it, they can be easily knocked off and, and the lids can come off or in when you have high gusts, if you have them outside, that those covers can actually blow off and you want to stop water from getting into the the, vault, the, the container because again, when it takes on the consistency of cement, it will definitely be too difficult then not only to use, but obviously to take out of those containers. And for short term storage, again, we recommend using those heavy duty plastic bags, which are securely tied at the top. So that's the end of our presentation as it relates to ash, a surplus, a surplus harvest. I hope that we have we have shared a quite a bit of information with you. I hope it has been beneficial to you, not only to those farmers that may have medium and large size farms, but those you you hobbyist gardeners and farmers. We hope that this presentation has actually been very informative, and that you can take some of the information that Alvin and I have shared this afternoon, this evening with you, and you can put it to really good use. So thank you. Thank you very much. A great job again, Stacy and Alvin. We have a few questions for you though. And um, so I'm gonna start and we'd encourage anybody else who has a question to just put it in the chat and we'll try to handle those questions at this time. I think you may have answered this one. Um, Enif was asking, if you have lettuce growing at home, is it wise to use it at this time? And I know you said about well, well, taking off the outer leaves, but I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. I, again, I, always, I have said you need to err on the side of caution. Um, you have to look at, we, we recognize that different areas in Barbados have had different um, varying levels of ash fall. So when you examine your plants, if the ash fall is really thick, um, you may have to part with those lettuce. If it is just light ash fall, um, you can remove the outer leaves, you can wash, you can wash your lettuce, and then you can also add, do the added um, washing in the vinegar solution. And that can actually help lift some of that volcanic ash from your lettuce. And you again, you err on the side of caution. Um, if, if you taste it, you can taste the lettuce. And if there is any if it has any off taste, we, obviously you will not eat it. But again, this is heavily dependent on the amount of ash fall that you have in your area. And we are asking you to err on the side of caution. If there is any doubt, just leave it out. Okay. Yeah. That I is agree. great advice. Yeah, I agree with her. You just, you just have to err on the side of caution and do a sample. Sample some of your products, your lettuce. Mm -hmm. And if it do taste funny, then you won't sell it or distribute it. Okay. Thanks. Okay, our next one. Um, as Marcy is saying, my mango tree is almost filled with mangoes. The majority of them are at the maturity stage, though still green. Besides washing the ash, ash off of them, is there anything else that I should do? No, I think it's good just to wash off the ash. Um, it depends on when she wants to harvest the mangoes, though, because mm -hmm. at that stage it'd be firm. And so it should not be, the ash should never have a real problem on the mangoes. 
right? And uh, Mardell is asking, what are the effects of ash on time? And how do I combat the effects? Um, mm -hmm. She said, well, she covered um, her herbs with a net, but the ash still penetrated when the rain fell. So more ash went into the um, herbs. So what should she do? Okay, she covered the, the, the crop with a netting first, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, well, once the rain is falling, it's going to penetrate on the inside. Mm -hmm. And as Tessa said, if she have an overhead mist or spray, uh, overhead irrigation, she mm -hmm. could irrigate it. But thyme is one of those crops, again, she could cut back the thyme and just allow it to spring back. Okay. Yeah, she could cut it back and allow it to spring again. Okay. All right. Um, here comes another one. If, if, and this is Tash, she's, okay. If ash is added to the ground that is not being used immediately, how soon can seeds or plants be put in the ground to avoid any effects of the seed, um, on the seeds and the seedlings? That's a, that's a good question. Um, once you incorporate it in the soil, because ash is a slow releasing fertilizer. Okay, so once you turn it in good in the soil, it shouldn't have a big impact. Um, because to be honest, we are operating without any kind of scientific facts. We don't know if the, the amount of sulfur is high, or how high is the sulfur, or how high is the fluorine. So the best thing to do is incorporate in the soil. You could probably leave it for about a week or two, and then you could use you could use it after that. Okay, I just was, I remember um, right doing our research, uh, it was reported, uh, remember the last volcano eruption was in 1979. Mm -hmm. And it said that in 1980, the next sugarcane harvest, the yields were increased just mm -hmm. because the ash was around in the soils. So yeah. it's a natural fertilizer, so mm -hmm. and it will break down slowly and, and release in the soil. Okay. Yeah. Great. We look forward to that. Yes. And one last question I have here. Um, Faye is saying, my cucumbers, watermelons, and squash vines all dried up. The leaves were burnt, but the cabbages, sweet peppers were doing well. They, they are doing well. What can I do to prepare my ashy soil to replant the items I lost? But soil preparation, um, strange enough for cucurbits all dried up from the ash. So they probably mm. were at a young stage where mm. the leaves were tender. But um, soil preparation, if it's a small scale, make sure she turn the soil plow it correctly or if she's using a tractor to incorporate the ash into the soil. So what you actually want is that the top surface, which is ash now, turns over and be in the bottom surface where it will be released into the root system. Okay. Yeah, that's important. So we need to do some forking along with um, washing to wash that uh, ash further into the soil. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Two, just two short points I just want to add. And mm -hmm. In terms of those who have um, who are harvesting water from the roofs and have the tanks, um, only this week we had I had two incidents where a farmer was using a pump, and because of the ash get in the water, it destroyed the pump. Wow! Right? Yeah. So we have to be careful. If you do have a pump, it's best to flush that water out of the tank mm -hmm. because you know some once you have rain and I had a lot of rain and there was ash around, it got into the water service water system. Mm -hmm. and actually destroy his pump after. So you have to be careful with the rainwater coming into your tanks. Yes, it's good to harvest the water, but at this time, you have to take extremely caution with that water you're harvesting. Okay. Okay, that seems right. to be all our questions. Thank you very much. Yes, Stacy has something to add? I just want to share um, quickly. Um, one of the things that we're also going to have to look <laughs> towards it's not necessary to look forward to it's not anything to look forward to mm -hmm. but um in watching um footage out of st vincent one of the things that the farmers in st vincent would have shared is that there are some areas that have been totally devastated and there are some farmers that would have shared that they have lost um acreage acres and acres of plantings for example and you know that barbie as we import quite a lot our food import yeah. bill it's for quite high. Um, and one of the effects of this, one of the follows from this is going to be on our imports. We, we know that we get our plantains, we get our bananas and such like from St. Vincent. Mm -hmm. And in the short term, we may actually be seeing um, some fall off from, for those imports. And um, one farmer would have shared that each week he actually sends up about 170 um, 
boxes of um, yeah, yeah. plantains mm -hmm. and he is now not in a position to do that mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm expecting that there are other farmers that will be in a similar position so we're going to definitely be seeing um, some fall off in those imports um, from St. Vincent. Yeah. yeah great point thanks um, I see one other one other question um, would Ash help to rid Suti Moon? Is that something? Yeah, I mean, just to make sure my mic is on. It wouldn't really help to get rid of sooty mold. It gets rid of some insects, the trips and those insects, especially oh. if you allow the ash to remain on the leaves. Okay. okay, so it will control some of the insects, but not directly sooty mold. Okay. Yeah. So then again, we were saying that um, leaving the ash on the leaves also <laughs> um, affects the way that the plant develops. So. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay but we're all in a learning curve so i think there's yeah. new things during the season of ash that we will we will pick up definitely as we go along yes yes okay great thank you very much everyone and again we were glad to have you with us and um we would encourage you if you have not yet started to follow us on our social media on social media you can follow us church of god at uh, at Church of God Silver Sands and that's YouTube or Facebook and we do invite you to follow us so that when we have all of these great presentations coming you'll be first to know you'll be well informed so again as usual I leave you with a quote something to encourage you because in these times they're difficult times difficult seasons that we're going through and we don't know what's coming next, but we know who holds tomorrow. And this is faith. Let your faith be active, dynamic, enthusiastic, radiant, and self-sustaining. Faith is the link between man's peril and God's power. With God behind you and his arms beneath you, you can face whatever lies ahead. So have a great everyone and a blessed weekend. And we look forward to seeing you next time.